Hello friends, welcome to Coding Garden. Welcome to A View from the Garden, your weekly programming tech interesting news show. So first up in interesting news, this article comes from eos.org titled NASA's double asteroid redirection test is a smashing success. Uh, so this is a mission from NASA called DART uh, and it's the first demonstration of asteroid deflection. So this is really cool because we've always seen like in science fiction, the idea of uh, deflecting an asteroid that's potentially going to hit Earth and destroy it. And uh, this was a successful mission showing that we can actually do that. So that's pretty cool. Uh, this article comes from skyandtelescope.org uh, titled, The James Webb Space Telescope is Finding Too Many Early Galaxies. Uh, I'll read you from the article. It says, as the, as the James Webb Space Telescope views swaths of sky spotted with distant galaxies, multiple teams have found that the earliest stellar metropolis are more mature and more numerous than expected. The results may end up up changing what we know about how the first galaxies formed. Also highlighted from the article, uh, one of the theorists tackling this problem is Jordan Marocha from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who presented later in the day, there's either an overabundance of galaxies or they're much brighter than our typical models predict. Marocha says he argues that multiple interrelated factors are at work in throwing off predictions. So this is really shaking up the science community because uh, the galaxies um, are too, too, too many of them, just too many of them. So this is super interesting. Uh, this article um, is titled The Style Guide of, for America's Highways, The Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. This is from John Keegan. Uh, and I found this fascinating. Um, uh, and especially just like the, the visual, uh, visually satisfying looking at this article. Uh, so what he talks about is how there is a big fat style guide that actually says what uh, U.S. road signs should look like the fonts that they use, the spacing, the color, uh, and it's called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control, first published in 1935. Uh, so this article was fantastic just to uh, see the, the aesthetics of, of road signs, which is pretty cool. This article from Stratry titled AI and the Big Five talks about the Big Five, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, and how they're using AI at their company. So AI has been in the news constantly lately, uh, and this is a good rundown of how those companies are actually using AI at their company. This article from Futurism.com by Maggie Harrison titled Deep Learning Expert Says GPT Startups May Be In For A Rude Awakening uh, talks about how there might be a bull case and a bear case for AI. Um, looking at the news recently, you may think AI is about to take over with Dolly 2 and ChatGPT and all of these innovations, uh, but uh, researcher uh, Francis Cholet kind of uh, gives you the, the opposite side. So what if what if things are not as good as they seem? And so this article does a good job of breaking down his arguments. Uh, and it's always interesting to to take a look at the, the opposite argument. Next up in interesting builds. Uh, so this build comes from Hackaday uh, from user Carrot Industries, and they created a fridge buzzer. So they were tired of accidentally leaving the fridge door open, and they created this thing that when they leave the door open for too long, it'll create an audible warning. So they created this PCB, they have a little piezo speaker that will uh, alert them if they left the door open. So this is pretty cool. Uh, this build comes from user VCCH, and it is a curtain LED screen. Uh, so you can see the, the curtains hanging here, and they show how they built this, and they were actually able to uh, project images onto it. So this is pretty slick. Uh, definitely check out their build here. They detail all the stuff that they used um, and, and give instructions on how you could build your own. Next up in YouTube videos, uh, this first video comes from Design Course Gary titled, What is a Full Stack Designer? You've probably heard the term full stack developer, but what about full stack designer? Well, in this video, I'm going to explain exactly what a full stack designer is, along with the necessary skills and tools you will need to become one. Now in short, a full stack designer is one who is able to handle the entire process of designing a brand identity for a company, yeah, so uh, this video goes in depth on on being a full stack designer, and it's a really good resource. I personally, uh, I'm I'm not as good at design, so this was a really really good resource for me. Uh, this video comes from Kevin Powell, King of CSS, uh, titled "My Dumbest CSS Mistakes and How I Debug Them." I like to think that I sort of know what I'm doing when it comes to CSS, but it doesn't mean that I still don't make really dumb mistakes way more often than I'd like to admit. And while I've made them often enough that you'd think I'd be able to debug them quickly, I often get stuck on these for a really long time. So today we're going to be looking at some of the stupid mistakes I make, as well as the easiest ways to debug these mistakes that can pop up in our CSS. 
One of the first examples he shows is doing pointer cursor instead of cursor pointer. Uh, that one's definitely gotten me before. So definitely check this video out. It's a good, it's a good watch. Uh, this video comes from Mutru titled, uh, Can You Solve This Front End Interview Question? Uh, this is a really good watch because it's a really good breakdown of complex front end interaction and the kind of things that go into building a complex front end UI, uh, especially in the context of an interview. So she talks about the kind of things that an interviewer might ask, some of the potential options and answers you can give and ends up writing some pretty interesting code for implementing autocomplete on a web page uh, with, with debouncing, canceling requests, and, and various other things. So definitely give this video a watch. This video comes from Code Report. It's called One Problem, 24 Programming Languages. Welcome to a Code Report solution video. In this video, we're going to be solving one problem in 24 different programming languages. The 18 languages that you can use on leetcode.com plus six others. So these are the animations in this video are fantastic. Look at these look at these the logo animations. We're going to be going. Uh, and then um, in the video itself, the code animates between various languages. Uh, so here's Moving a on JavaScript to two other solutions that follow the same pattern: JavaScript and TypeScript. These solutions are identical. If you look at the bodies, the only thing that's different is the function signatures, obviously because TypeScript has types. Pretty so this video is a great watch, especially if you're interested in what these other programming languages are like and what it's like to solve the same problem in multiple programming languages. Uh, next up in developers and tech. So this is a tweet from uh, Gail Breton that says, looks like CNET just did their coming out about using AI content for SEO articles. This is fascinating because we knew it was coming, but uh, this is one of the first instances of seeing this in the wild. So uh, if you look at some of the articles that have been posted by CNET, this article was generated using automation technology and thoroughly edited and fact-checked by an editor on our editorial staff. Fascinating. So the article is initially written by AI and then gone in and, and fact-checked. Now, I think this is the one thing that needs to happen, especially if an article was like generated by something like ChatGPT. It needs to be fact-checked. Uh, and so this is kind of, you're seeing the, the merging of AI with an expert that can fact-check it. Um, but it is interesting that they've, they've written a whopping, what was it, 72 articles in this way uh, since November 11th. Um, so that's pretty fascinating as well. This is a research project called Volley that comes from uh, Microsoft. Uh, neural codec language models or zero shot text to speech synthesizer. So in their paper, they write Volley emerges in context learning capabilities and can be used to synthesize high quality personalized speech with only a three second enrolled recording of an unseen speaker as an acoustic prompt. Experiment results show that Volley significantly outperforms the state of the art zero shot TTS system in terms of speech naturalness and speaker similarity. Sounds great. Show me an example. So they have in, in their in their paper here, they have examples of various text. So in this example, speaker prompt is the original voice clip used to generate the audio through volley. So this is the speaker prompt. He descended the ladder and found himself soon upon firm rock. That was the speaker actually saying it. Ground truth is the speaker saying the text over on the left hand side. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that the Warrington had fulfilled his mission. So that's the real speaker. Baseline is like current text to speech, and so this is kind of what we're used to. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that Warrington had fulfilled his mission. Right, so it's very robotic, it doesn't sound very natural. And now here's Volley. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that Warrington had fulfilled his mission. There's more pauses, it sounds more natural, and so you can compare Volley with Ground Truth to see the original speaker saying it versus uh, Volley's generated version of it. There's also these shorter examples like this. It is just a tax on employment. So that's the prompt used to train it. This is them saying the sentence. So what is the campaign about? The baseline. So what is the campaign about? Right, very robotic, and then Volley. So what is the campaign about? That's generated versus the original. So what is the campaign about? Amazing. So this is really cool advancement in text-to-speech. Um, they do, t and so this actually hasn't been released for anyone to use. They're just showing their results. And they do have an ethics statement down at the bottom talking about how this kind of thing is potentially very dangerous. Um, so they haven't actually released the, the models or the code yet for anyone to use uh, because they definitely want people to use it responsibly. Uh, next up, pirateweather.net was launched. So if you're familiar, the Dark Sky API was acquired by Apple and then uh, shut down. So so this was a weather API used by a lot of apps and websites that no longer work because public access and API access was removed by Apple. Pirate Weather was created that has the exact same format. So it's essentially a drop-in replacement for Dark Sky and can be used in any site that was using the Dark Sky API before. So uh, the, the webpage talks about what it is, 
what it's doing. And they actually are using legitimate sources of data from like the NOAA. Uh, and specifically, these forecasts are, are called like HRRRR, uh, which is why it's called pirate weather. So it's not called pirate weather because it's illegal. The, the sources of data are legitimate. It's called pirate weather because uh, the, the weather models uh, are called HRRR. Uh, and the developer thought that sounded like a pirate going R. So that's why it's called pirate weather. Um, admittedly, maybe not the best branding, but this is a legal and good replacement for the dark sky API. This article comes from Variv Kajenko titled Interviews as a Service, the Bad and the Ugly. I'll read you the first paragraph. Once the pandemic hit and employers started to embrace remote work, more openly, a new phenomenon gained momentum, interviews as a service. I'm not talking about ones where you get people to help you prepare for some challenging interviews at fang-sized companies. Nope, I'm talking about the scammy kind, where qualified people turn up for the interview, be all charming, and then receive an offer in an unqualified person's name. Sound bizarre? It is. So they give a rundown of this happening to them, and then also potentially how you can avoid it. Well, this was really relevant for me because when I was hiring at my last company, this actually happened quite a bit where the person interviewing was not the actual person who was going to be working the job itself. So this was an interesting read. So this article comes from jmao 111 It's titled Thoughts on OS Security. So what they say is, I wrote some guides about operating systems I've used for many years as a casual user, but also as a developer. So essentially, they give a breakdown of Mac OS, Windows, and Linux, and what you can do as a regular user to make sure that you're secure. So these were really good reads. Uh, I especially looked at the Windows one and the Mac one, uh, and they're just a good run down of what you can do to make sure you're secure on your computer in the operating system that you use. This comes to us from GitHub Next uh, by Amelia Wattenberger, and these are code brushes. So this is a plugin for GitHub Copilot that allows you to apply various transforms to your code. So for example, you can take unreadable code and make it readable with a simple transform. So if you have something like this deeply nested ternary statements, you can then turn that into actual like readable code. Also, you can take code that uh, doesn't have types and add types to it, fix simple bugs like uh, off by one errors and stuff like that. Um, and then also you can make your own code brushes on the fly. So this is fascinating. It seems like a really cool use of GitHub Copilot. Uh, so definitely check it out. Next up, this article comes from Level Up Education called Transitioning from Software Developer to Manager, and it's written by Abelez. Uh, this is a good read if you're later in your career as a software developer and you're curious on whether or not you want to become a manager or should you stay in the technical track. So what they say is there comes a time in every developer's career when you'll have to make a decision about your own progression. Do you stay as a developer slash senior developer and focus mostly on code or do you make a jump into a management level position as a lead developer who has to manage staff or a development manager? So this is a good read. It gives you the pros and cons of both, talks about what you can ask yourself to, to make that decision. So definitely check this out. So this article comes from hoho.com titled your tech stack is not the product. Uh, I actually think this is very relevant with all of the, the arguments and drama happening on Twitter right now, because at the end of the day, we just need to ship features. It's not necessarily about what tech we use, we need to provide business value to our customers. So in this article, they say, if you're a technical co-founder or an early engineering lead at a startup, and you want to talk about your microservices, hand-rolled CICD, in-house monitoring stack, or any other unique part of your stack, like your styling choice, I'll say, cool, let's riff. <laughs> Um, but ultimately, your technology stack is not the product. A mindset of technology being the means, not the end, is uncomfortable, but it will help you stay focused on what matters most, the product and your customers. Avoid wasteful misadventures and maximize the company's chance of success. So this was a good read and, like I said, really relevant. This comes from Liam Quigley. It's called NYC Slice, and they talk about how they've been logging every slice of pizza that they've bought in New York City since 2014. It's fascinating. They have a bunch of data. They've overlaid that data on a map and, and charted the prices. A really good read, definitely check that out. This article comes from Scott Antipa titled How to Store Your App's Entire State in the URL. Now you might have noticed when you use apps on the web that are like web-based editors, like the TypeScript Playground, or in this instance, like a diagram editor, you might see like a big long string in the URL when you want to share that code or that diagram with someone. And this article runs down how you might do that. So typically what you're looking at here is a base64 string, but they also talk about how you, how you can do further compression to shorten that shared URL without needing any sort of backend. So essentially, I could give you this URL, you could go to it, and you load the exact diagram, but this was not saved in a database URL. The, the information about the diagram was in the URL itself. So this is a super interesting read, especially if you want to implement something like this in one of your applications. This was a recent tweet from Brittany Postma who says, it looks like Apple Music has brought Svelte out of beta and into the live site. So if you didn't know, uh, beta.music.apple has been around for a few months, and it was being written in Svelte, but it's finally in production. If you go to music.apple.com, this was written with Svelte. So if you look at the source code, 
Svelte is everywhere. And I was actually thinking about this. This was a really good decision on the part of the creators of Svelte. Uh, I think this has to do with the scope styling inside of Svelte, but the fact that Svelte is all over the source code is like a really good advertisement for Svelte itself. So this was cool because this is a big production app that people are using and it's built with Svelte Kit. So this is a new segment where I'm going to highlight some of the questions that were asked on Hacker News. So this one is, is TypeScript worth it by Robert Todd? And it's just a really good a conversation about should you be using TypeScript in your projects? And you have good answers from both sides and, and talk about the pros and cons of using it versus not using it. Uh, this one is lead developer, but I just don't enjoy enjoyment from throwaway 040991. Uh, and so talking about they're a lead developer, they don't like managing, what can they do? And, and this again has some really good conversation. This one is what do you talk about in one-on-ones with your managers? So there are a ton of really good uh, comments and answers about things that you can bring up in your one-on-ones that will create meaningful conversations instead of just filling 30 minutes of time. Uh, and then lastly, this was a thread on what's your favorite illustration in computer science by Gene Null. Uh, so a lot of really good resources here on uh, various computer science topics that have been visualized. Next up, let's talk about JavaScript news interesting libraries and new releases. So the state of JS has been released. I encourage you to go check it out, explore it, and also check out the new feature Data Explorer. So this actually lets you take two aspects of the survey and demographics and compare them against each other, which is pretty cool. So definitely check out the results and see where your favorite framework or library sits in terms of popularity and usage. Next up, webcomponents.guide was launched. Uh, and this is a really good resource on learning about web components. So web components are essentially a built-in way in web browsers to create create reusable UI components, uh, similar to the kind of thing you might do in like React or Vue or Svelte, but it's built into the web browser. Uh, so this is a really good guide that breaks down how do you do it, talks about the shadow DOM and everything else you might need to know in working with web components. So definitely check it out. Uh, this article comes from Steve Sewell on builder.io and it's titled Safe Data Fetching in Modern JavaScript. This article is fantastic because it breaks down everything that can potentially go wrong by just using fetch by itself. I've talked about this a ton on my live stream and showed a lot of examples, but they do a really good job of breaking it down and, and showing you one thing versus the other. I think one thing they didn't show, which I will point out, is the fact that we're assuming that the responses here are just JSON. One of the things that a library like Axios would do is content type negotiation, so it can actually figure out how to parse the response. But this does a good job of talking about error handling and kind of like refactoring into a usable function, it talks about common things you might forget to do like stringify a JSON body in a post request. So it's a really good write-up. Definitely check it out. Now, lastly, uh, a new segment as well, your public blue screen of the week. This one comes from user Val300, and it was spotted in a large shopping center in Switzerland. Uh, and I think it's beautiful. <laughs> so uh, r slash PBSOD is public blue screen of death if you haven't seen it before. But people basically just post pictures of computers that have errors on them in public spaces, like on menus, on billboards, and different things like that. So it's kind of like programmer unintentional art. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. And lastly, Coding Garden is brought to you by viewers like you. I do not take any corporate sponsorships on my YouTube or my Twitch. Everything I do is viewer supported. So if you'd like to support me, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon, becoming a YouTube member, a Twitch sub, or a GitHub sponsors. Any of these things are a great way to help me monetarily. You could also check out uh, merch that I have, merch.coding.garden. You can get this cool dark JavaScript t-shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely tune in over on twitch.tv slash coding garden because I'm live right now. All right, hope to see you in the next one.